Good afternoon and welcome to the first of our bright blue Ludgate lectures, named after our offices, so far as anyone has offices now, and designed to look at the shape of things to come. We could call it Building Back Better. We're delighted to have as our inaugural speaker, the European Union's first ambassador to Britain, Jua Valle de Almeida. Jua has previously served as EU ambassador to the United States between 2010 and 2014, so he has a fascinating geopolitical perspective on current events. Our relationship with the EU seems a pretty good place to start our series on rebooting Britain. The ambassador described pre uh, Brexit as a divorce. On that analogy, everyone ends up poorer and crosser, and there seems to be a smell of rotting fish outside Downing Street. But the future is an unknown opportunity. It's the opportunity we're going to be discussing this afternoon. As for our perspective, Bright Blue is an independent think tank and pressure group for liberal conservatism. So I shall give the floor to the ambassador to outline the character of the new special relationship between the UK and the EU. Then I shall start a conversation about the nuts and bolts as well as the ideals. And please will you submit your questions to put to Joua uh, on Slido, hashtag Ludgate Lectures. We have an R in all, so we will crack on. Ambassador. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good to see you again. And uh, great to be to be invited. I have privilege and honor to, to be the first speaking in this uh, uh, series of lectures uh, by Bright Blue. And um, I, I think this is a very timely uh, opportunity, I must say. I mean, we are, um, these are not normal times. And I think we should be, uh, you know, very much aware of that and very much humbled by that. Uh, first, we have a, a tragic uh, pandemic upon all our, all our countries. And I, you know, there ain't much we can add to, to the difficulties that we are all facing. And I think we should be humble. Uh, but if there is one lesson that we can withdraw from this COVID crisis is that we are in this together. Uh, that was the same feeling I had when we were trying to manage the financial crisis a few years ago. Uh, that's the feeling I had uh, when we were all concerned by a, a migratory crisis around around Europe, uh, and uh, and that's how we will feel in Glasgow in a few months, uh, dealing with climate change. These are issues that no country alone can address in a successful way. These are issues in today's times, the beginning of the 21st century. There's hardly any issue that does not require a degree of cooperation and solidarity. Uh, on a global, at least on a regional uh, level. But these are also interesting times, of course, because we've just um, concluded a, an operation of separation, let's put it this way, if we don't want to call it a divorce, but clearly uh, the, the, the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union is a major, a major event. Uh, it took place, uh, it concluded in just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's, it's the right time to start thinking about what comes next. But I, I couldn't uh, ignore what is going to happen tomorrow in, in a, a city where I was posted a few years ago, Washington DC, with the start of a new cycle in the United States. And we all look forward to this new cycle as much we had some issues with the previous cycle. And, uh, and I think that's also very important to keep in mind when we take a look at the, at the global picture. I, I cannot not mention also uh, what goes on around the world in terms of the new uh, power play and the big players rivalry, uh, the rise of China and uh, the, the relevance of China in our external relations, but also the impact it has in our own domestic uh, uh, affairs. And so all this needs to be taken in consideration as we start a new year and, uh, and the number of new cycles, if, if I can call them so. So my, my first point will be that, uh, what is the future of, of our relationship? Well, the future is ours. Uh, it's for us to shape it, so for us to build it, it's for us to format it according to two very important uh, criteria, I would say, our values and our interests. Uh, and uh, I think our starting point is a very clear one. We share fundamentally the same values across the channel between all of us 
and the UK. For some reason, we were together for almost half a century. This will not fundamentally change. I don't expect the UK now to, uh, to adopt different values from the European Union or the, the other way around. Of course, there is a common set of values that will continue to share, we we'll continue to promote, and we'll continue to try to preserve. Uh, the other is are the interests. You know, we have common strategic interests. We have common interests in terms of the security of our citizens, in terms of the well-being of our citizens, in terms of the prosperity of our citizens and our businesses. And this, all this unites us in a, in a way that cannot be ignored. But there's more than that. There's everything that, has, that is behind us, uh, history, uh, a shared history. Uh, and the latest cycle of that history was the UK inside the European Union, contributing immensely to what the European Union is, is today. We can come back to some of these issues. And then there is geography, maybe one of the few things we cannot change. Uh, and geography means that we have zero kilometers between the two of us in the island of Ireland, a few uh, dozen kilometers in, in, in the channel. So we, you are our closest partner by definition. I dare to say that we are also your closest partner, at least in terms of geography, I hope much more than that. So this is the sort of the basis on which we need to build this relationship. And my approach and the one I wanted to share with you today is that I believe this is a turning point. This is the, the beginning of a new cycle. Um, Brexit is concluded. Uh, we successfully avoid a no deal situation. And I, I underline the importance of this, uh, uh, this point. It is obviously a, a painful separation. Every separation is painful, I would say. Uh, some in, in Britain are very disappointed, very frustrated, very sad. So are we, but we need to respect a democratic decision taken by the British people, and we do respect. And the point now is to move further, is to turn the page and to build what I think can be a virtuous cycle of relationship between our 27 member states, the European Union and the United Kingdom. I like to say that there is life beyond Brexit. It's for us now to build that life, to, 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 to make it happen in a way that it works for our citizens, it works for our businesses, but it also fulfills what I believe is our role in the global community as, as countries that share fundamental values of, of, the, of democracy, of the rule of law. Uh, we, we, want, uh, we want human rights, of course. We want to build, uh, uh, and it certainly needs some help. We, not, we want to sustain and even strengthen a, a rules-based global order. And I think our, all our countries, all our 28 countries have a particular role to play in that. So let's, let's move on. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's approach this new cycle in a, in a constructive way. Um, let's uh, build on our strengths. Uh, let's of course respect our diversity and the differences we, we have. I, I think uh, the values are the foundations of our relationship. Uh, the interests are sort of the, of the, of the concrete that uh, sustains it. Uh, and the rules of the game have to be mutual respect and trust. Uh, if we take all these boxes, I think uh, uh, we can look forward in a, in a positive way towards this next cycle of our, uh, of our, of our relationship. Uh, plenty of challenges ahead, but also plenty of opportunities. And this is the kind of spirit I wanted to share with all of you uh, today. I'm sure we're going to go back to some of the issues of negotiation, some of the difference that we have among us, but let's not forget uh, the essence of things. And the essence of things is that our citizens and our businesses, and I would dare to say the world, needs the EU and the UK uh, to get their act together, uh, to build on the basis that we have with these agreements and to, and to move forward. And if I look at 2021, let me finish with that. I see, I see G7, Britain chairing it, uh, and the COP26 on climate change. Uh, you know, let's take these two illustrations of uh, how much the international community uh, hopes for us to, to contribute on, on the G7, on everything dealing with COVID and the post-COVID and the build back better uh, approach and uh, climate change, uh, maybe the biggest challenge ahead of us in the coming in the coming decades. So, 
there's plenty to do. Let's do it together as much as possible. And let's make this relationship work in this new cycle. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. I think that that slogan of life beyond Brexit will, will stick to. And in fact, um, I should say that we're live tweeting this event and using the hashtag um, new beginning. So we're taking it in your spirit. Um, and I wonder if I can just start with a, with a sort of conceptual question. I'm just checking that map behind you that we haven't been erased from it. Um, you, you, you say that um, we're not all members of the European Union now, but that we are all Europeans, and that's the bedrock of our future cooperation um, in outlook and in values. And I, I just wanted to ask you if the UK still feels European to you. There's talk of us modelling ourselves on low tax, low regulation Singapore, or forming a new kind of Anglosphere. And do, do you think our relationship to Europe is just a geograph geographical accident? Or, or do you feel that there really are sort of common, there's a common outlook? Well, first of all, I have a map behind me, but because I'm a bit tired of all these analyses of bookshelves and uh, <laughs> what kind of, uh, And I prefer to have, the, to have the world behind me. Um, listen, no, uh, more seriously, I, I have absolutely no doubt that we are all Europeans, not only because of geography, uh, but because of things that are even more important than geography. I, I, you know, I go back to the values. I go back to the interests. I go back to, I go back to the interconnection of our societies, of our, the, the fabrics of our society, uh, our business uh, uh, operators, our families, uh, you know, uh, our friendships. Uh, you know, how many people, how many Europeans live in the UK? How many Brits live in the European Union? This is a very solid, very deep, very, very, uh, very strong. Uh, uh, sort of commonality that we have uh, among us. And I think this is really the bedrock for what we can do uh, afterwards. Uh, of course, we will most likely uh, diverge more than in the past uh, in a number of areas. That's, I believe, the purpose of Brexit to a certain extent. Let, let's see how we, you know, I've been involved in my life as European diplomat in many operations of enlargement. Uh, basically countries wanting to converge with us. This was my first and I hope the last operation in which I, I was involved in, in an operation of divergence, a country leaving and wanted to do things differently. Uh, and, and we respect that. I think what we have to do is to organize this divergence in a way that suits our interests on both sides and respects our values. I think this is the, the core challenge that, that we have. Uh, but we must respect and we must trust the other side. And that's, um, that's what we're doing and that's what we hope to do on the basis of the agreements that we reached uh, recently and are now being uh, uh, be put into operation on our side. You know that we still have to wait for the ratification by the European Parliament, but I hope that in a few weeks, everything will be settled and we can start again this uh, new beginning, uh, this new virtuous cycle in our relationship. So I'm confident. Thank you for that. And, and just um, in terms of where you sort of play the EU's relationship now to us, to China, to, to the US, to the, to the big blocks, the, the UK is the third biggest trading partner um, for the uh, EU. The second biggest is China. The first is, is the US. Can you talk a bit about the EU's future relationship with those two blocks, China and the US, and the potential threats? It, looks as if the new administration in the US is going to take quite a hard line on China. And how is the EU going to balance um, your investment? You, you've just done a big China comprehensive agreement with, uh, with what America believes and what, what um, actually the UK is, is, is um, flagged concerns on things like labor rights in China. Yeah, well, listen, these are uh, among the most important relationships for any country, but certainly for the European Union, and I dare to say also for, uh, for the UK. Uh, and we are talking about here, I mean, on your side, your biggest partner, uh, a biggest neighbor, your former family, uh, and, and, and a, the US, a country with which you have a special relationship, and China, of course, which no one can ignore these days. Well, the same is very much true for us. 
as you said, you are our third trade partner. The U.S. is is the most important one, and uh, and China is 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 coming up as as uh, of course an indispensable partner from an economic point of view, but also uh, important to say a competitor, and also a systemic rival. So there are huge differences between the US and China in terms of our uh, uh, relationship. If, if I take the U.S. first, I think we are, as I said, waiting for this new cycle in the US. Um, we know President Biden. I had the, the honor to meet him a few times. Uh, I think we know most of the people that will be working on foreign policy, for instance. They are uh, friends of many of us and people that we know and trust. Uh, but of course, there's always uh, an element of, of uh, a nuance or a difference with the US in a number of areas. I, you know, I witnessed that when I was ambassador there. Uh, they are tough negotiators. Uh, good luck for your trade deal. Uh, we did manage to conclude TTIP, but I hope we can we can progress in other areas with this administration. So I think it's uh, it's uh, it's good news that we have uh, a, a new ch a change in America, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, the bilateral uh, dimension, but also the global one. Uh, President Biden, President Elect Biden, has announced that they will come back to. Uh, to the Paris Agreement, for instance. I mean, this is great news, and this will be a major contribution to move forward the climate agenda. We'll see what we can do together on, on Iran, on uh, you know reviving the JCPOA, which is central in our relationship with Iran. Let's see what we can do in other parts of the world. I think there will be a discussion, important one among all of us, uh, on uh, the relations with other partners. And I think that within the G7, within the G20, in other formats, uh, I, I hope and I expect that the EU on one side, the UK on the other, and, and the US can, can have lines of convergence and certainly at least lines of dialogue on all these issues. And that in doing so, we uh, contribute to, again, uh, our values and our interests. The relationship with China, as I said, they are, they are a partner, a negotiating partner. We have deals with them. We do work with them mentioned, for instance, climate change. They are also a competitor and a very solid competitor in economic terms, as we all know, but they are also a systemic rival. Their system is different from ours. They don't stand by the same values as you do, and, and it, this needs to be taken into consideration fully. So we are approaching this in a, in a sort of a comprehensive way, our relations with China. You mentioned the, the, the agreement on investment. This is just one tool one tool in a toolbox of uh, instruments and, 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 and ways in which or through which we deal with, with China. And we should not want to ask uh, this, this investment agreement uh, to address all the problems that we have or all the issues that we have with, with China. I still believe this, this is a positive step in terms of market access to, to the Chinese economy in terms of elements of level playing field, because we obtained a number of commitments from China that will make uh, the relationship, uh, uh, you know, gradually more leveled up. And we also obtained uh, important uh, uh, elements regarding sustainable development, you know, regarding climate change, corporate social responsibility, uh, but also commitments regarding labor, labor standards. Uh, uh, you know, China has committed to uh, develop all its efforts to uh, uh, sign up to ILO conventions. This is important. But again, this is only one tool in our toolbox. Others will deal with human rights. Uh, we are very attentive on, on, on foreign investment screening in Europe, coming from all parts of the world without excluding China. And, uh, and also there are a number of unilateral measures we can use on our side. So uh, in any case, coming back to the, your initial question, I think China, uh, is likely to figure in, in, in any uh, top list of issues that we would like to continue discussing with, the, with our American friends as much as with our United Kingdom friends. Could you see it being a point of divergence so that you're able to make a sort of leap of faith um, in your trading with China that, that, that um, the US and the UK um, are much more skeptical? No, I think, I think first of all, we need to respect the autonomy of each of the players. Uh, uh, we respect your autonomy, you should respect ours, I'm sure you do. And the United States should respect yours and our autonomy in dealing with, with China. I think 
as we respect, of course, United States autonomy. Uh, and that should be uh, a principle to, to, be, to be respected. So, uh, you know, there should be no problem if one country takes an initiative uh, on its own, because that's part of their uh, autonomy of decision. Uh, what is important and what uh, we were doing that with the present uh, American administration is to have a dialogue and the way we deal with uh, major partners like, like China. And I'm sure we will have that dialogue with the, the new American uh, administration. Uh, and just on trade, you said that US hard negotiator, good luck. Any particular tips, you know, for instance, on whiskey? Um, tariffs is that <laughs> what would, what would you do if you were setting out now? Well, I have a few a few yeah. trade scars, a few American <laughs> trade scars uh, myself, and um, and um, now listen, it's it's uh, it's well, first they are tough negotiators. Secondly, they have a big market, so they have assets on their side. Uh, they have a number of, of tools. Uh, that are very important in any trade negotiation. Uh, I would be very attentive to everything that has to do with the agricultural side, uh, everything that has to do with the regulatory convergence. Uh, you know, the problem with the US is not about tariffs. Tariffs are very low, if I, I'm speaking on behalf of the union, uh, but I think this is valid for the UK, of course. Uh, problem is not tariffs. The problem is uh, the regulatory side of things. And how much can we converge? How much can we cooperate? How much can we find a, a sort of a common common ground? Um, uh, and this is uh, not easy to, to achieve uh, because uh, there is resistance on the American side, resistance in Congress, resistance in a number of economic sectors. Uh, but I think it, uh, it's worth to try because, you know, if we if we if we manage between us and the US, or between you and the US, or the three of us. To, to progress in terms of the way we, we approach international trade. I think this is a major contribution uh, and a major way for us to influence the global scene uh, in terms of uh, liberal uh, order, in terms of a rules-based order. Think of WTO. The World Trade Organization is now blocked uh, largely because of US action, but not only. It desperately needs reform, desperately needs re-energizing. Uh, you know, if, if we join efforts between the US, uh, the EU, and also the UK, I'm sure we can, uh, we can, we can do a lot uh, to, to, to adapt and reform WTO in the direction that suits our interests and our values as well, as, as you know. And this is the kind of international cooperation at the multilateral level, at the plurilateral level, and even at bilateral level that I, I, I would like to see happening in the coming in the coming years. That's interesting because at one point we thought we were all going to be operating on WTO rules. Just one last word on 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 America. Did you, so you talk about agricultural sort of standards? Do you think that we probably we are going to have to shift um, our standards on animal welfare and so on um, if we're going to get a proper deal? Does it is that your um, no, analysis? We were, we were not ready to do that. Yeah. That I can guarantee you, we were not ready and we still are not ready to compromise on standards. I cannot speak on behalf of the UK. I'm just saying that these issues will be on the table at any given time in a negotiation with the US. And of course, this has impact. I mean, in, the, in, a, in an open economy, in, the, in a globalized economy, any, any, anything that our partners do has an impact on us as well. So we'll be, of course, also very attentive to, to this. Uh, and uh, and um, as you know, our deal uh, includes elements of, of level playing field and uh, and respect for standards and all that. So uh, all this is 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 of our interest as well, as much as of anything. Any agreement between us and US will be very closely followed by the UK. I'm sure. Um, and we've talked about the common values. Just just um, if we can talk a bit about the sort of divergences then that um, are inevitable, and um, particularly on the sort of financial services, um, as I think you pointed out, there are about a thousand pages to, to, to go through. Um, but the financial services industry is obviously very, very important for us. 10% of our economic output employs 2.3 million people. Um, where do you see the sort of bumps on the road um, on that? And, and I have a first question from George Parker of the FT. Of why don't you grant equivalent status to UK financial services rules? As you said you would do last June, are you trying to punish the city? Now, we are not in the business of punishing George. 
whom I know from, from Brussels and good to see you in the, in the call. Uh, now, we are, this is not a punishing uh, business. This is a, a, an issue of finding the best, the best balance. Let, let me say a couple of things on finance. First of all, I think it's a myth uh, that uh, is uh, often written uh, or talked about that there is nothing on finance in this deal. There is. Uh, and there is, first of all, uh, market access. So markets remain open. Our markets and your markets remain open for the operators on the other side through establishment. If people want to establish in, in, our, in our market, uh, they can. Of course, they have to follow our rules, but they, the market is open. It's not, there is no protectionism in terms of establishment. Uh, and they can establish themselves without any discrimination. Secondly, we are open, and we actually already talking about it, uh, uh, regulatory cooperation. Uh, it's very important for regulators in a global market to, uh, to share the understanding of the issues. Uh, they are basically dealing with global companies, right? People, uh, companies that operate in a global level. So that's, it's important that they share the understanding of the issues in the market. Uh, important that they share good practices. I think we can learn from you, you can learn from us. Uh, and we should all raise our awareness about the risks involved. And all this is part of what we call in our jargon, regulatory cooperation. We are discussing right now a, a, a memorandum of understanding that would allow us to cooperate. We do that with the US uh, and in a, in a very fruitful dialogue with the US. And we would like to have the same with UK. So this is a second element to add to the, the openness of our market. On equivalence, this remains a unilateral uh, domain. You provide equivalence to our operators, uh, we provide to, uh, to yours. And these are unilateral issues. They were not part of the negotiation. They remain so. Uh, we started that. We have already provided two equivalences on clearing and on uh, central securities depositaries. Uh, don't ask me exactly what that means, right? Uh, but these are important for the financial financial operators. We are working on other equivalences. They will come when the conditions are met. So, George, no punishment, just a weighting of all the elements. We are certainly waiting for more elements coming from the United Kingdom. As much as the United Kingdom is looking at a number of equivalences on their or, or on their side. So. Um, uh, there, there will be more coming on that. I cannot reveal any particular calendar. If, if Britain were to um, pursue a, a Singapore low, low tax, low regulation model, what, what would be the EU response to that? You know, this was, this was one of the major sort of elements of discussion uh, in, the, in, our, in our negotiations. And, uh, and we come to a deal. We come to an agreement on how we should um, how we should uh, sort of approach uh, this. Uh, well, basically, what I was saying earlier, the, this uh, divergence. Uh, so I think there are elements there that provide each side with the, the tools and the opportunities to to react to any situation that they consider excessive in terms of, of divergence. There are mechanisms of arbitration and dispute, dispute settlement mechanisms that are, are quite uh, sophisticated. And I think uh, both sides were reassured by that to the point that they signed the deal. So I think the, 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 the issue is well, is well sort of organized in terms of the deal to allow us to, to address some divergence that may Come up. But again, that's the choice of the UK, how far they want to go on that. It will be for us uh, to judge uh, the extent to which it sort of violates this principle of level playing field. And if that is the case, there are me mechanisms in the treaty, in the agreement that allows us to, to discuss and eventually to come to, to, to an understanding. Uh, if no understanding, that there are retaliation measures that can be applied from, from both sides. So again, I don't want to speculate on how far we will diverge of what kind of problems we'll have in the future. Uh, let's see uh, how, how things uh, evolve. And, uh, uh, but, you know, at least we have a framework under which and within which we can, um, we can address those issues. And that's very important if you compare to a situation of a no deal, uh, uh, we have predictability, we have, we have certainty about uh, how we can deal with issues. We have no certainty about how much we will diverge obviously, uh, because that's part of the autonomy of decision on, on each side. 
And it's since you use the word retaliation, and uh, there's a, a question here from Francisco Castello Branco. Um, the United Kingdom is a friend or a competitor of the European Union at the political level? At the political level, is a friend, by no means. We are allies in, in, uh, in of course, uh, most of our countries are members of NATO, so is the United Kingdom. Uh, we again share values and uh, strategic, fundamental strategic interests. So we, of course, we are allies and we are friends. We are also competitors. Oh, actually, yes, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, yeah we, we are also competitors in terms of uh, in economic terms. That that's yeah. that an open market, and uh, uh, we are all competing, and and that's good. Competition is a good thing, provided it is well regulated. But in terms of, in political terms, we are uh, certainly allies and friends. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And, and in terms of some of the sort of wider consequences, perhaps still to come, or repercussions of, of Brexit, um, we've seen that the, the Brexit divorce has put some internal strains on the family and that the Scottish nationalists are using it as a reason for a new call for independence. It wasn't what they wanted. So do you see that the union could be an issue in Scotland and even eventually Northern Ireland if the protocol chips away? And, and how would the EU regard a plea for help from the Scottish nationalists? Well, as, uh, as I, I, I say often, uh, the rule number one in my line of business is not to comment on hypothetical scenarios. <laughs> uh, and, and I will Unfolding, not. Unfolding, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, and I will not, uh, particular ones that are of a domestic uh, uh, nature. Uh, now, what I can uh, what I can say regarding uh, the devolved nations, and you mentioned two of them, is that of course, uh, you know, we wish, and I wish personally, to establish very good relations with the devolved administrations. I visited Wales and Northern Ireland. I made a virtual visit to Scotland. I spoke to uh, to the the. the the, the first ministers of all these devolved nations, and, and, and I'm ready, my team as well, to engage with them. That, that's our focus right now. We deal with the, the authorities of the United Kingdom in London, but we also have dialogues with the devolved nations. But I don't wish to comment on any development, possible development inside your union. I can comment on anything inside my union, but not yours. <laughs> not a disunion. Um... Uh, we talked about um, uh, some of the environmental policies being, you know, where the, where the um, great work's going to be done. And here's a question from Patrick Mohan from RAP. Um, how can the UK and the EU work together constructively on environmental policy, potentially having common objectives, but allowing divergence on how we achieve them? I think there are two elements in that question. First, what we can do together, and uh, my answer is a lot. I still remember the role that the UK played inside the European Union to uh, move forward our climate agenda. This goes back to the early 2000s, uh, a British prime minister of a different political color than the present one uh, did a lot for that. And this was followed by, by the conservative government that came afterwards. So it's been a consistent line of, of the UK to bet on everything uh, fighting climate change. And this has been very important. We continue ourselves to be leaders in this, our countries and your country. And, uh, and I see a lot of um, potential for our cooperation inside the, the UN business, you know, the Glasgow, but not only. So um, on our side, we are uh, making very ambitious uh, commitments. The recent one on the European Green Deal uh, to be climate neutral by 2050, with uh, a pledge to reduce by 55% by 2030. Uh, I welcome the, the, the announcements by the UK. They go very much in the same direction. Our calculation is that what the, the UK has committed to do would be similar to what he would have been expected to do if he was still a member of the European Union in terms of the share of his effort. So we are absolutely convergent as far as climate change is, is concerned. Second point is, as you implicitly said in your, in your uh, question, what do we do overall with the environment, with the environment standards, with uh, how do we approach all this? Then we go back to our TCA, Trade and Cooperation Agreement, where elements are there of, uh, of no regression, uh, of, uh, but also opportunity and possibility for unilateral measures and mechanisms of arbitration. So I think, I hope it won't happen, but if it happens, the, the tools are there. But I want to be 
uh, more, uh, let's say, wider and maybe more positive about this. I think what I see in the UK and what I see in our, on our side is an approach to climate change that this, this, it's no longer, let's say, romantic as it, as it was 20 years ago or so or more. Uh, it's no longer seen as a burden on our economies, but rather it is more and more seen as an asset and an element of competitiveness of our economies. And this, I think, is extremely important. It's a, it's a, it's a, ga a game changer in a way, uh, in the sense that it is it has become something positive and not something which is negatively perceived. So if that is the case, I see the risks for divergence in terms of standard less important than they would be in, in, any, other, in any other context. If all our goals are to uh, achieve higher degrees of competitiveness for our business operators, and if we see that climate change is becoming a factor of competitiveness and not the opposite, then I see good ground for us to converge rather than diverge in moving forward in this climate uh, and environmental agenda. So let's see what time brings. But so far, at least in any case, as I told you, we are very focused, very motivated to contribute to, to the success of Glasgow. We hope it will be a, a, a physical meeting and not a virtual one or a hybrid one. We'll see how much we can do uh, COVID-wise, but uh, uh, we are very committed to, to, to work together on this. And I see, I see the sense of a, a convergence rather than divergence in, in this whole environmental area. Um, and what are your priorities for um, G7, um, which uh, comes first and should be in June, should be <coughs> June real? What, what, what do you hope to um, achieve there? Well, you know, G7, it's, it's very, people think of G7 as seven people around the table. They are actually nine people around the table because we have our two presidents, uh, Charles Michel and Usa von der Leyen at the table. And, uh, and if you consider the, the, the composition of G7 out of nine, uh, six right. are European. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> including the UK. So uh, yeah. I, I think there's, if you have six uh, Europeans in nine members, there's some, uh, there's some leverage there, right? Uh, there's, there are ways for us to influence the agenda and the outcome of the G7. Uh, and uh, the change of administration in the US goes in, in, a, in a converging direction. And of course, our, uh, our Japanese friends uh, and Canadian ones are very much aligned in a number of areas, if I take climate is clearly uh, uh, one that, uh, that, that ticks that box. Uh, what I see as priorities, I think we have to, I think we largely agree with the priorities announced by the Prime Minister. Uh, everything dealing with health, COVID, uh, build back better. I mean, this is the priority right now. You know, that's, that's the service we need to provide to our citizens need to find a way, a path forward out of the COVID crisis. Uh, providing uh, uh, security, health security, or sanitary security, but also a means to, to, to recover economically. And I think this is what uh, G7 is, is basically uh, about. Uh, the other one is climate in the run-up to, the run to, uh, to Glasgow. So I see again here uh, a great, uh, great convergence uh, among the two of us, and maybe also with other partners. So I think, and, and mind you, this could be COVID allowing uh, the first physical meeting of the G7 for some time, and uh, and that's very important that our the global leaders meet, and uh, and uh, and they are meeting with a number of other countries, as the prime minister has announced, um, uh, countries that are again largely converging in in most of the areas I mentioned, and certainly uh, democracies that uh, we want to uh, to engage with as well. So I think it's a promising. Uh, at least at the level of preparation, a promising G7 summit. And do you see a change in the political character of um, of Boris Johnson? You know, you're used to him as a as a disruptive negotiator, um, and now um, and now it's over. What what does um, post divorce look like in terms of personal relationships? Well, I. You know, I've been involved in this issue for some time to know that personal relations among leaders is extremely important. 
uh, and uh, there ain't that much that us uh, diplomats, uh, bureaucrats, or whatever experts can do if that is not a good relationship at a leader's level. And that's uh, that's uh, very important. That's why I'm looking forward to a physical meeting rather than a virtual one, uh, if possible. And that's why I'm looking forward to to the G7 meeting again as such. Uh, I think that's uh, that's very important. And you know, our leaders, of course, have that responsibility, and they know what to adapt to different interlocutors, so I, I will not make any comment about the Prime Minister, but I think I think I stress the fact that uh, on, on our side, uh, if I take uh, Mrs. von der Leyen or Mr. Michel, they've been talking to the Prime Minister recently very, very often. Uh, I think there's a good relationship being built there, and uh, and uh, and I count on them to, to do what I've been trying to uh, say uh, uh, this afternoon, that is to create the basis for a virtuous cycle. And this is what my two leaders at least, and I think I can speak also on behalf of the other leaders of the member states of the European Union. That's what we want to do with UK in respect of our differences and, uh, and in respect of the commitments we made in the withdrawal agreement and in the trade and cooperation agreement. I think Mark Sedwell, who was cabinet secretary and, and said today that um, it was a misunderstanding that that, um, that that Boris Johnson could be classed as a as a British Trump. In fact, they were much more comfortable with with the Biden administration. Do, 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 uh, does that sound right to you? And have have you sort of reculculated your your view of uh, Boris Johnson since um, since Trump? No, I, I you know I don't want to make subjective subjective judgments, and certainly not on the personality of of your prime minister, whom I respect, and I, I, I got to know him when he was a, a journalist here. Uh, no, but on uh, in an objective analysis, if you look at all the issues that we have mentioned throughout our conversation, uh, and if you look at the agenda of President Biden and what used to be the agenda of President Trump, I think an objective analysis leads you to say that there is more in common, substantially, in terms of policy and uh, and political agenda is more in, in common between uh, between what we do ourselves and what I believe are the positions of UK in all these issues, uh, more in common with, uh, with uh, the announced agenda of President Biden than the, the agenda of the, of the current president. That's an objective analysis, I think, without any subjective consideration. <laughs> and in terms of sort of common security, um, aims um, and values. Um, do, do we need a joint approach to Russia and the treatment of Alexei Navalny, which we've seen um, in, in the past few days? What's, what's your view of what's going on? In well, we, we clearly condemn the, the, the arrest and we clearly ask for the, uh, the release of, uh, of Navalny. Uh, and that's our clearly our position. And we, we said it publicly, the high representative uh, again repeated it today and that that's the position we, we having we, we believe that's not justified at all and uh, and I see again a good convergence in our positions on this good uh, uh, so I've got some more questions coming in one from Ronald Lehman do you believe that there will be future brexits from other members of the European Union and if so which country might be next in your <laughs> opinion who do you want to nominate you know um, Back in back in 2010, 11, 12, 13, when I was ambassador to the United States, I had that question regarding the euro every day, every dinner, every lunch, every meeting, whatever. Uh, and they were saying, well, what is the next one to leave? Uh, I mean, meaning leaving the euro. We're talking about some countries in difficulties. And I said, well, so far, no, none. Uh, and, uh, and well, the reality has proven that uh, uh, the number of members of the euro area increased rather than decreased uh, since the, the financial crisis. And the euro is still there as a very solid currency and, uh, and the doomsday scenario don't materialize. So if I, if I tr transpose this uh, example to, to the, the, your question and the Brexit question, what do I see? Uh, I see after Brexit, since, uh, well, after the referendum, let's put it this way, since 2016, I see support for Europe going up in all our countries, at least on average, going up, not down. I don't see any country, uh, not even any important opposition party in Europe, uh, advocating uh, exit from the European Union since the, the referendum. Uh, 
And I see uh, the European Union uh, in the last few years taking a number of very important and bold decisions uh, that uh, uh, lead me to say that the, the Union is, with all its problems that we all have in this uh, uh, non-normal times, that the Union is, 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 is doing quite well. I mean, take our response to the, to the COVID crisis in terms of um, uh, you know, recovery. Uh, you know, we, we made a quantum leap in terms of equipping ourselves with the financial means and the financial mechanisms to deal with this crisis, uh, which are absolutely unprecedented in magnitude, in terms of the amounts of money, but also in qualitative terms. We're doing things that some people call the Hamiltonian moment. Uh, I would not qualify it like that. I prefer to say a Monet moment or a Schumann moment in terms of our founding fathers, uh, but they are extremely important. So in a nutshell, Brexit did not produce new Brexits or new exits. The Brexit produced increased support for the European Union. Uh, and, and, and in the last few years, uh, after Brexit, we were able to uh, to make quantum leaps in the way we organize ourselves and we set our goals. So, uh, so far, uh, I don't see that risk happening. But you never know. Hypothetical scenario, I don't comment. But <laughs> today, uh, I know elements to, to, I have all the elements to contradict our, our, our friend who asked the question. So you don't want to nominate a country that you're thinking might wobble? I don't the, see any country wishing to leave the European Union right now, yeah, to be yeah. frank. Of course, Brexiteers said that uh, we were able to make a big dash to the vaccine because we weren't held up by all that EU red tape, but um, uh, the different ways of looking at this. Can, can, can I just ask, um, I asked at the start if we still feel, if the UK still feels European to you. Um, I suppose um, the other um, side of that question is, is how the EU feels without us? Does it feel more European now that we're gone? And does um, and where do you feel the centre of political gravity is? Is it um, German centrism or French ambition? Or, or, or how does it feel in, in the EU without us? Well, let, let, me, let me give you a personal, a personal reply. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to see the UK leave. That's my position, I think. This is shared by my authorities and by the, it's a position of the European Union. We did not want you to leave, but we respect your decision and we have made sure that we can accommodate you uh, in a new relationship. And that's what we've been talking about today. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, the union changes without, without the UK. I mean, otherwise, if I said the country, I would be, uh, you know, uh, I would be just uh, minimizing the importance of the UK in the European Union. I think the Union is a different Union without the UK. Uh, whether it is better or worse, not for me to judge, but it's a different one. It, it has an impact, of course. Uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, we are reacting quite well to that in the last few years. Uh, and, and I hope that continues uh, that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, how, how much would this will change the union? I don't know. I mean, if you go back in time and you see areas where the UK was less keen for the European action, take security and defense. Well, objectively, you have to say that in the last four years, a lot has been done in the union on security and defense that maybe would not have been possible if the UK was still a member. That's one area. Uh, if I go to, to, to the, the financial package that we uh, approved recently, uh, maybe it would have been a bit more difficult uh, to have it approved if the UK was still, uh, was still a member. I don't know. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, the UK was a, a great defender of the single market and, uh, and of competition and uh, of open markets and, and, and and, uh, and lesser regulation. So this, you know, it's, we'll, we'll see how, how, how we will evolve without the UK. So uh, we regret, but we respect absolutely the decision taken. We are adapting to a EU without the UK. And uh, I, my, 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 my assessment today is that we are not doing too bad. And, and without the sort of challenger of always having the, you know, the, the sort of 
the grumpy person in the room. Um, does it just make things sort of easier to make decisions or do you worry that um, you're not, that, that, that you don't have that challenge? And, and is there, um, are you looking for someone to provide that role? Is there a country that naturally mm -hmm. fits as the grumpy person? <laughs> uh, listen, um, I used to tell my colleagues that uh, I don't like to have yes men and yes women around me. I, I, I want people to, to contradict me and to say, you're not doing well there, you should do better. I think this is, this is good. And I think to a large extent, uh, our British friends played a, a very important role in the European Union, to be very frank, uh, in terms of uh, you know, creativity, in terms of looking at things, sometimes a little bit different from, from others. I think this is a, sort of, uh, a source of, um, uh, of uh, diversity and, 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 and good for any organization like, uh, like the EU. So I very much value the, the contribution of the UK to the European Union. You know, I, I think it's fair to say that we will not be what we are today if we had not had the, the, the UK as a member. We may be, a, we could have been a different, a different entity than we are. So we recognize the historic role of the UK. Uh, we regret their departure, although we respect it. And now we are building a EU at 27, which by the way, uh, if I may say so, is still a global actor. I mean, we are still the biggest internal market in the world. We are still the biggest provider of foreign direct investment in the world, uh, the biggest provider of, of humanitarian aid, development aid, you, 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 you name it. And uh, so we, we are uh, you know, very proud of what we have achieved and we will continue to do now without the UK, but we want to do it together with other parties. And, uh, and UK is a key ally, a key friend, a key neighbor. So uh, that's, that's built on that. Thank you. And um, time for a couple more questions. One is um, on, on the, 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 um, the theme of global players. Um, it's from um, H Suzuki. From the view of the EU, what do you think about global Britain, which focuses on the Indo-Pacific area? I think we are all global actors. The EU is a global actor. The UK is a global actor. Other countries are all, all also global actors. And, uh, and I very much respect that. My, my main point here is, is to con uh, sort of consider this kind of issues against the backdrop of a rules-based order being challenged. And our values being put in question in the, in the global seen for a different reasons uh, in, the, in the last few years. And that's why I say these are not normal times. These are times in which a, a global uh, rules-based order that we built basically after the Second World War and, and strengthened after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall, uh, this order is being challenged. Uh, and uh, those who believe in open markets and open societies and a, a liberal global order and I believe this, uh, this bright blue uh, organization stands by that. If we believe in all that, uh, we need to count on all global actors that share these values and this vision of the world. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's uh, what I expect uh, the United Kingdom, global Britain, if you want, uh, to, to I, I would expect them to play that role and we're looking forward to uh, work with them in that uh, in that perspective. This is the kind of uh, let's say priority that I would say out. Now the choices of, of Britain in terms of external relations are their own as much as we make our choices uh, and we should respect the autonomy of decision of each side. We should respect our differences, but we should also uh, continually continuously search uh, for a, a common ground, areas on which we can work together. We mentioned a few today and uh, there are maybe more, and, uh, and that's where we should focus. Where can we work together in respect of our differences to try to uh, you know, preserve and promote our values and our interests in the international scene? And there's a lot to be done there. It's an uplifting sentiment, and you're, you're quite right, Bright Blue would certainly concur. Um, and thank you so much. I'm just going to um, finish with the last question, and you'd be disappointed if it weren't about fish, wouldn't you? where we start and end. Um, this is from David Hughes from, from PA. Are the problems with fish exports teething problems which will be smoothed over or the permanent consequence 
of being outside the single market. And I don't know if you've seen the vans outside Downing Street uh, with people who's, who's a rotting shellfish because they just can't get it now out in time. And, and is that the explanation has been, oh, well, it's just teething problems and a bit of sort of COVID, but is this going to be the future for a sort of just in time economy? Well, um, I, I like to say that decisions have consequences uh, in the sense that the choice made by the United Kingdom to leave the European Union first and then to leave the single market and the customs union, uh, the sort of Brexit that you opted for has consequences. And one of them is that there had to be checks and controls at all borders. Uh, there's no way out of that. Now, we have negotiated ways and means to, uh, in some areas temporarily, in some areas more, more you know, for a longer term to facilitate as much as possible all that. But there are elements on which you cannot, uh, you cannot, elements which you cannot ignore in terms of phytosanitary uh, quality control, uh, taxation, uh, all the, the issues of VAT and more. Uh, paperwork is, is going to increase, you know, uh, because you are no longer in the single market. You are no longer in the, in the customs. All that is true. Uh, and, and, and people, businesses uh, have to adapt to that. That's one element that I want to be very clear about. Decisions have consequences. Then you have uh, issues that are linked to, uh, to, to the transition. I mean, it's true that the agreement was reached on Christmas Eve. It's for some companies, for some business, very difficult to adapt from Christmas Eve to, to, the, first, to the new year, to the first day of January and be ready, totally ready, sometimes also for the, the, the customs administration to, to. So there are elements here of which are of a temporary nature, of a transition nature that will improve with time after the first weeks. Difficult now to judge which is which, uh, but the two elements are there. Our hope is that, and we are also ready uh, in a number of areas to, to help and to inform and to clarify together with our British uh, friends and um, we hope that things will improve in the coming in the coming weeks. But uh, don't forget that uh, things have fundamentally changed because of the departure from the EU and the departure from the single market and the customs union. Uh, a special relationship, but still a divorce. Um, João uh, Valle del Amida, thank you so much for your time today you, and for your for your insights. And we look forward to a a special relationship. Thank you very much to Bright Blue for organising this and to the European Union delegation, um, all of you for taking part. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. And I hope this is the beginning of a, of a long conversation uh, with you and all your team, but also people that were kind enough to listen to, to me today. And uh, I'm at Smith Square and you can reach out whenever COVID allows and I'll be happy to host you there. Thank you very much. Love, to, love for that to happen. Thank you so 